Hello, my name is Ben Zimmer and I'd like to welcome you to the next installment of the LV Mastery Tip Jar. In this video blog we present hints, tips and tricks that will hopefully be useful to LabVIEW users of all levels. I've entitled this installment Arrays of Clusters of What? And I say that with a certain emphasis because that's quite often the response given by students and new users of LabVIEW when they start to see some of the more esoteric data structures which are used behind the scenes. Turns out, and as we'll explore in this blog entry, that the data structures are not at all esoteric once you see and understand the reason behind them. So we're going to talk about, in particular, arrays of clusters of arrays. We're going to motivate how that is such a useful structure by diving into the way that the waveform graphs work, in particular, with multiple plots. We're going to start with a quick reminder or an introduction to clusters. Then we're going to go through a few varieties of waveform graph implementations. From there we're going to talk about another application of arrays of clusters, in this case how to store data records which contain multiple pieces of different types of information. We're going to then go into a couple sorting applications, one which involves sorting on a 2D array, and then we're going to contrast that with the flexibility of sorting on an array of clusters, and how one of the real benefits of the polymorphism features of LabVIEW allow us to do that really, really easily. And throughout it all, we're going to investigate a few different OpenG functions, which of course make life easier. Let's start with a quick reminder of what a cluster is. A cluster, which is available, of course, from the cluster subpalette, when you place it on the block diagram by itself, the cluster object is going to generate a broken VI. And the reason for that is a cluster is a combination of different types of data. And until we've told LabVIEW what type of cluster it is, we're going to have a broken VI. And if we were to try and run, we'd see, of course, the reason for that error is the cluster control contains no elements and is undefined. So let's satisfy LabVIEW, and we can see that we can create a cluster by putting controls inside it. So just as we place controls on our front panel, instead of placing them directly down on the front panel, which of course creates a terminal, we instead drop it inside the bounds of the cluster object. And then we see here that we've created ourselves a cluster with a numeric and a boolean inside, but on the block diagram we have a single terminal because both of those pieces of data actually reside within the cluster. So there's a five cent review of clusters. Basic points of a cluster are that you can combine different types of data. They can actually be any type of data. And as we're going to see later on, clusters can also contain arrays and clusters can contain arrays which contain other clusters, and so on. So let's get rid of this guy for now. Go back to the block diagram. Just create a very simple random number generator. What we're going to do is we're just going to create 25 random numbers, and we're going to throw them up on a waveform graph. So let's go back to our front panel, create our waveform graph, connect it up. Now, by no means are we going to consider this extreme LabVIEW programming. We've done the very simple task of creating an array of numbers and putting them on a graph. So where this gets a little bit more interesting is when we have two sets of numbers and we want to plot them. We need to find a way to combine this data together. And the simplest way we're going to start with is using the build array function to combine together these two one-dimensional arrays. So we have one set of data being generated out of this top auto-indexing terminal, one out the second, and when we connect them both to the waveform graph, now we see that we have two plots. The problem now comes when we modify our code slightly. Say our top loop is generating 25 data points, and our bottom loop is generating 50. We're going to modify it so that each of these only generates one set of data, and now we'll combine the two together. Now when we go to the front panel and we run our code, we see, sure, we've got 25 data points of the white, we've got 50 data points on the red, but when you take a closer look, it's not actually doing what you expect. Particularly if we show our points on the white plot, we see that we've got points all here at value 0. If we go back to our block diagram, we see the reason for this is, although we've got 25 data points here and 50 data points here, is that when we combine these two one-dimensional arrays into a two-dimensional array, it has no choice but to make that array rectangular. What I mean by that is, if we were just to place a breakpoint right here, when we run the code, if we turn on highlight execution and continue, we'll see that it's going to tell us the array size, which of course is a 2 by 50. In other words, we cannot have a sparse two-dimensional array. If we combine one-dimensional arrays together into a two-dimensional array, 
for the purpose of generating this graph, we're always going to force all the arrays to be of the maximum length. So how do we get around this problem? The proper method of creating a multidimensional graph where we have different array lengths is to actually use the bundle function in between those two processes. So in other words, we take the array out, we put it into a bundle. We take the second array out, we also put in it into a bundle. Now that we've done this, when we build our array, what we're actually building together When we complete, complete this, we see that our waveform graph has changed to be a pink data type and a thick wire because, of course, the waveform graph is polymorphic, meaning it adapts to take the right data type. Let's turn on our context help and hover over this wire. We'll lock the window. We see that this wire here is a 1D array of clusters containing a 1D array of numbers. So this is that whole arrays of clusters of what? This is the data type of this wire is an array of clusters of arrays of numbers. The first time you see this, this may be a, somewhat confusing. But the reason for this, and we'll see the benefit of it when we actually run the code, is that now we have two plots of different lengths. We no longer have 25 white plots stuck at element zero. We now have two plots that are truly of different lengths. We can change that first plot now to be 75. And when we run it, we see that we've now got 75 points of plot 0 and still the 50 points of the red plot, which is plot 1. The next thing I want to talk about is sorting of 2D arrays. And then we're going to contrast that with sorting arrays of clusters. The next example I just quickly want to go through is the 2D numeric sort VI. It's a VI which we quickly pre-created here. Essentially what it is, is a simple structure which contains an event structure within a while loop. So it's just reacting to button presses. There's a shift register which contains the data. In this case we can see it's a 2D array of double precision numbers. We can see that it's been pre-initialized to be empty. So we start off and we explore. We see that in the generate event case, when the generate button is pressed, it's going to create a 2D array of data, display that in the indicator, and put it into the shift register. So if we were to run it, and click that Generate button. We see, indeed, we've created all of this data. The key point of this VI is actually in the sort event structure case. So if we look here at the sort case, we see we're actually, by activating the context help, using an open G function called sort array. Now the sort array function is a polymorphic function which contains instances for nearly all the possible data types that you would like. In this case, it's using the instance where it's going to sort a 2D array of doubles but it could also be used to sort one-dimensional arrays of any data type as well as two-dimensional arrays of nearly any data type. You see here that it has three inputs, the order, the sort by in, and the column row to sort by. When we return to the front panel, let's turn off our context help, we see we have created controls for these three data types. So what the point of this function is, is to be able to sort a 2D array by any particular column or any particular row. So what we're going to do here as an example is we're going to sort all this data. We're going to try and sort it by the second column in descending order. So let's change our order to be descending. We're going to change our sort by to be column. And we're going to change our column index to be 1, which will point to this index. If we just quickly scan through these numbers manually, we see that the 942 number is the largest. So we're going to expect this number to be at the top. But the way this function works is it does much more than just move that value to the top and sort this column. It sorts the entire data set, keeping each row together. In other words, if we're expecting to see this value at the top, we can expect to see the 355 and the 787 at the top beside it. It's going to move the entire row. So when we click sort, indeed, we see the 942 at the top, we have the 355 and the 787 at the top. So it's moved each row accordingly to the desire to have sorted by that first column descending. We can switch that to ascending and resort. We can change it to sort by row as well, which does the same thing in the opposite manner.